This for the first time, or the second or the third, we are so glad that you're here. We invite everyone to please sign the pew registration pad and pass that down. Not only does it give us a record of those who are here, but it is a, a wonderful way for you to help us update uh, our database of membership. Uh, if you will put your name and address and phone number, and if you got an email, you can put that there as well. We are making sure that we have everything that we need, and we hope that you will uh, do that with us and for us. I have a few announcements that I would like to share with you. Uh, the United Methodist Men are meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 uh, for supper, so we hope that you will be here in the fellowship hall at that time. Wilder Elementary still has their education partnership going on. Please contact uh, Fran Castleberry. And there is a box at the end of the hall there as you make the corner for the Guatemala Mission, uh, and you see the uh, notes about Wednesday night supper. Uh, on February 9th will be our Scout Sunday. Uh, and we will be introduced again to the scouting units that are part of our worship life, are part of our mission life here at Trinity. And uh, Josh Castleberry is also extending the invitation for uh, all scouts, uh, Eagle Scouts, new and old. Uh, if you uh, would like to participate in the worship service that day, please let him know. Our fellowship, Sunday School Fellowship, we had scheduled for next Sunday. We're going to make it a, a more regular uh, routine, and we're going to move that back to the fifth Sunday, so that will be the last Sunday of March. Stewardship Committee meets today at 4, and we got a lot going on in the life of our church. We invite you now to stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Good morning, church family. We're going to ask that you join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin this morning. I'm going to have to retrain my brain because this time I'm going to be reading the non-bold print and you guys are going to be reading the bold print as response. Open your ears and hear. Sowing the seeds of life. Hear what your Savior says.
Thank you. Please join me in the opening prayer printed in your bulletin and remain standing as you are able in mind or in spirit. O Lord, Lord, your word word is indeed life to us. May we receive it with joy, unencumbered by the concerns of our lives, caring only to hear your invitation of grace, abundant life in your service. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and will our children please come forward for our children's time. What we got? What you got? Airplane? That's cool. A big one. It is big. It's very big. Hey, Grady. Come on. You can come on up. There we go. Come on up. Yes, come on, Evelyn. Here we go, Charlie. Come on in. Come on down. I want to ask you, you, you today about if we wanted to plant some flowers, okay? It's, uh, it won't be long until spring comes. Do you think we could plant flowers if we just threw some seed here on this marble? Do you think it would grow? No? Why not? It doesn't have light. Yeah, you're right about that. But it's what else is wrong with it? It doesn't have soil. That's exactly right. It it, it would be, we could leave it right there and Mr. Earl would sweep it up, right? He'd just sweep it up and say, that's not going to work. Well, what if we had some flowers and um, we had... And and briars, that's exactly what I was going to ask. What if we put those flower seeds in a bunch of ground that had briars all in it. Do you think they would grow with with briars and thorns? I don't think so either. And it would be hard to pick them, even if they did grow up, because... uh, You only dig them without any words or people. That's right. Nobody else can do it. And if if the ground has rocks in it or gravel in it, It's hard for it to grow there because it doesn't have any way. But what if we put the flowers in good soil, in really good soil, like like, like you get at the nursery where you get plants or in, in your grandmother's backyard? What? Do you think we could grow flowers there? That makes them beautiful. You're exactly right. I'm impressed by your word of actually. That, you, you lost me there. You had me there, Philip. I'm sorry. With actually. All right. So we can, grow, we can grow flowers in really good soil. And, it, and the flowers will grow big and they'll grow strong and they'll be beautiful. Well, Jesus tells a story, a parable we call it, about growing and about growing plants and of sowing seeds and that we are like that different kinds of, of soil. Sometimes we have soil, our, our minds and our spirits are like thorny ground and, and we just, you know, all the other things in the world just choke it out. Or we're like rocky soil and, and, and the word of God and love of God doesn't take root. Or it's like this floor. You, it doesn't penetrate at all what God is wanting us to do and say and be. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> I'm glad you know my first name. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. And they do do seeds. Can I have the children's sermon back now? Because I've got to hide my LSU socks. <laughs> I lost this children's sermon some time ago, I think. Anyway, what Jesus wants us to do is we are the good soil. And Jesus wants us to receive the word of God and the love of God and to grow big and strong in him. Okay, can we pray? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for children, for children who, teach who teach us to laugh, to, laugh, to, learn, to learn, and to love. They are fertile ground, O oh God. Amen. Thank y'all for coming. my Bible on the wrong page here. Bear with me a second. Please remain standing in body or spirit as you are able and listen to the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 4 verses 1 through 12. Again he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into the boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on land. He began to teach them many things in parables and in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. 
Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let everyone with the ears hear and listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they, might, so they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the good word. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. be seated. This morning, I want to uh, tell some of you that may not have heard already, you heard uh, Paula Stover offer the message last week and lead the worship service, and then we had the charge conference at the conclusion of that service, and uh, Paula Stover was, uh, how do we want to say this, Uh, by unanimous consent she was approved as a candidate for ministry from Trinity United Methodist Church. So we're very happy for her, and I think it would be appropriate if you wanted to give an amen of affirmation. Let us pray. Sometimes, Lord, your word is difficult to understand, What happens to us in our everyday lives puzzles us. But in this time and in this moment, may the words that we share this day not be the end, but an invitation to something greater with you. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a seminary class at Candler School of Theology. It was filled mostly with new students, new first-year students. These were students comfortable with their sense of absolutes about the faith, about the Holy Bible, and about God. Most of them lived with a black or white view of the world. There were no shades of gray, no ambiguity, no uncertainty. And at the front of that class stood an older gentleman with a frumpy mustache and a frumpier coat. His name was Dr. John Hay. And this was his class, the introduction to the Old Testament. John Hayes knew the mindset of those students because he had seen hundreds of students like them in his class in the decade before that day. Professor Hayes also knew the Holy Bible from his life, the time that he spent wrestling wrestling with the biblical context and the biblical word along with his faith. He knew the centuries of scholastic interpretation that had come down through the ages. John Hayes knew that the best teaching he could offer those students was an opportunity to wrestle, to wrestle for themselves with the Holy Word, with scholarship, and their own understanding of God. Because to be a pastor, 
They had to find a way to live with ambiguity and uncertainty and of not understanding all of the Holy Bible and still holding on to the faith. Professor Hayes no doubt knew on day one of that class that most of those bright-eyed students in that class that day would later come to the same conclusion about passages of the Holy Bible that he had and countless others had discovered. The simple truth is there are some passages in the Bible that we cannot figure out. Verses and stories that we don't understand. He knew that they would come to know and appreciate a phrase that was often used in his classroom. We just don't know. We just don't know. Many a scholar and student of faith has used that phrase when describing Mark chapter 4 verses 10 through 12. The words of Jesus come right after the parable of the seed and the soil when he is alone with his disciples. And Jesus says these words, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those on the outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look but not perceive and that they may indeed listen but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. Puzzling words. And we know that verse 12 is a quote exactly from chapter 6 of Isaiah. But we're less certain about what Jesus was trying to do here. Less certain of his point. Was Jesus saying that the parables are a group of confusing riddles so that the vast majority of people won't understand the ways of God? Was Jesus saying that the parables are difficult, so difficult, so that people will not repent and will not be forgiven? Some of the faithful, like you and me, have interpreted these words a lot of different ways. Some have seen it as proof that the kingdom of God is about a secret, sacred knowledge that only a select few can get. That God preordained that some people would get salvation and some people would not. Others think that Mark misunderstood or misheard or misquoted Jesus. Again, as Professor Hayes would say, we just don't know. But we just don't know is not a response that we hear only in a sterile seminary classroom or a word we offer in a friendly Sunday school class, or heard voiced on the shores of the Sea of Galilee by a group of puzzled disciples. We just don't know is more for more than just the Bible. It's used any time that human answers and human understandings fail. It is a well-worn phrase voiced in exhaustion at the outer marker of reason. For many of us, it marks a dead end to our study and a stunting of our faith. But what if, what if this curious dead end of not knowing It's not a dead end, but an invitation to something else. Rather than focusing solely on these difficult verses and thereby pull a thread out of the beautiful tapestry that is the gospel of Mark, what if if instead we looked at that thread as it is woven into the tapestry of the good news of Jesus Christ? 
Surely Mark did not intend for us to surgically remove just a few verses. Mark intended the passage to be heard as a single unit. So let's see how it connects to other threads and other biblical themes. In the verses that precede the, our problematic passage, Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples and all of his listeners what it is like for people to grasp the life-changing power of the gospel. He tells them this parable of the soil and the seed. God sows the good news of abundant grace into all of our lives, but we do not always respond fruitfully to that grace. There are times in our lives when we are like rocky soil and the, root does, and the word does not take root in our lives. Other times we're like the thorny ground and the cares and competing priorities of our lives choke out the word. And there are times in our lives when our arrogant self-reliance makes us as hard and as impenetrable as an asphalt highway or a marble floor. Evil carries away the gospel seed. Thankfully, there are times when we are receptive and open to the word and it takes root in our lives and we are transformed, we are forgiven, and we are freed for abundant life. No matter what the ground is, rocky or thorny or perfect, the sower generously and wastefully scatters the seeds of the gospel in our lives. No matter where we are in our lives, God still scatters the seed, whether we deserve it or not, whether we understand it or not. But on this particular day, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the telling of the parable of the seed in the soil did not yield an abundance in the souls of the disciples in a way that Jesus had hoped. Mark tells us when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. It seems their response to Jesus' telling of the parable was a variation of the very human conclusion. We just don't know. Even as the disciples confess their limited understanding, Jesus tries again. In the verses that follow the reading that we had today that Josh offered, he offers a translation of the parables and then he offers other parables, other ways to reach around their particular spiritual dead end. He does that throughout the Gospel of Mark. The grace of God finds another way. There will always be biblical phrases that make us scratch our head and confess our ignorance. And that reality mirrors the living of our lives when reason fails and our strength wanes. The times we're more like the hardened path, the rocky ground, or the thorny patch rather than the fertile ground. Christ, the good sower, casts the word again and again and again into our lives. Grace is scattered even when we are ag arrogant and when we are ignorant. God's grace that is cast in our lives is not limited by evil or human fickleness or even our competing priorities. God reaches past our not knowing to move us along the path of faith in another way. Just as surely as we would be directed to another route, when a bridge is out in the highway ahead, Christ continues to scatter the seeds of the gospel 
even when we say we just don't know. Because we just don't know is not the final answer. It's not a permanent thing or a frustrated eternal state. Instead, it's an invitation. It's a confession. A confession on our part to not knowing all the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And an invitation for us to be open to the other ways God's grace is cast upon our lives. We just don't know becomes a holy nudge to keep us growing past our human limitations further into the grace and mercy of God. Professor John Hayes knew what billions of others have come to know. The good news of the gospel, the good news of this parable is about the love of Christ, holy sower of the gospel seed. The love of Christ that is deeper than our understanding. It is a love that reaches past our weary confessions that we just don't know. It goes past our intellectual, emotional, and spiritual dead, dead ends and becomes a doorway for God to reach us. These are the opportunities for God to sow grace into our lives again and again and again until we are moved toward receptive insight. We're all going to have moments where we just don't know. May God bless those moments in your life at the outer marker of your reason the outer marker of your strength. May the we just don't know moments bless you to grow in spirit and in truth so that we will all love and serve God and others. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite you to join me in standing for the affirmation of faith. It's found on page 881 of your hymnal. Would you respond with me, please? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we gather today, we gather knowing of soldiers and airmen from our community that are in harm's way on the other side of the world. We gather knowing that there are people like Ernie who are in rehabilitation trying to make their body work once again. We also know that there are those around us who are hanging on by thread, who just don't know what to do next, who just don't know where the next answer, the next paycheck, the next treatment will come. And so today we gather in this place and we pray. I invite you 
to have a moment of prayer for your own heart, your own life, and for your family and friends and church at this time, and then we'll have our morning prayer. Let us pray. Spirit of God, Spirit of truth, for those that sit in these pews this day, for those who wonder about surgeries and treatments last week, for those who have lost a job. For those who are trying to discern the right path forward for our church. Hear the prayers of your people this day. The prayers for direction and guidance and strength. Prayers for forgiveness and hope. Prayers for friends and colleagues and classmates that are far away on the other side of the world, standing against foreign armies and terrorists. Lord, we just don't know. In the year 2020, that seems to be a word, a phrase that comes to mind so often. It happens in our politics, it happens in our work. But, oh Lord, use that statement for us as an invitation to grow in faith and in truth, in hope and in love. May we be beacons, may we be vessels of hope for our coworkers and employees, for our neighbors and friends and church members who sit beside us on the pew. We ask you, O oh God, to hear our prayers this day in this solemn and holy place. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We have today a report from John Merkel because of the Board of Trustees, but we're still waiting on a couple of things to come through, so I've asked John to wait for it. You want to do it now? You can do it now? Okay, go ahead. You had baby duty earlier, so. I know why. Okay. And you had a precocious Philip, so. We sprung me free. Um, hi there. I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm John Merkel. I'm the new uh, chair of the Board of Trustees. And also for those of you who don't know that the Board of Trustees is responsible, among other things, for the care, maintenance, and... Um, condition of the, the property of the church. And so we wanted to give a bit of an update on where that stands, you know, now at a time just before the offering, to see where, um, what we who are held it to, in trust to take care of things are doing uh, to take care of those things. So <clears throat> over the, the past year, we've had a lot of some repairs, some improvements and upgrades. The church has renovated or updated uh, the four women's restrooms in the facility. I'd encourage you to go see them. Um, the Fellowship Hall women's restroom has turned out really wonderfully. Um, 
many of the exterior doors have been refinished and we replaced the portico door coming in from the parking lot. Uh, there have been roof and parapet repairs to fix leaks and we're preparing to repair the roof on the office and classroom wing of the sanctuary space. So um, Gwen's office, the media center, that the roof immediately around here. Um, we repaired floor joists in the education building. Uh, we have some upgrades to the HVAC units and controls uh, in the education building. Some of the equipment and uh, carpet and things in the education building were last done in a renovation in 1988. So they're uh, due. <laughs> Uh, including, so we replaced the downstairs hallway carpet in the education building. We were getting ready to do the upstairs uh, and the stairway carpet, and we're looking at what we're going to do in the classrooms themselves. And uh, like I said, a lot of this, some of it has been there since older renovations. We're trying to look at a combination of necessary repairs and uh, repairs and upgrades, especially in conjunction with our new long-range plan. I know we know one of the things in conjunction with that long-range plan is looking to making sure that the church is welcoming and inviting. Um, so things like the carpet and the restrooms and the portico door uh, are things that we're trying to do in conjunction with that plan. So if you have ways that you think um, the church can be improved and more welcoming or see places where something needs to be repaired, please tell a trustee and let us know so that, you know, we don't have all the eyes and ears, so if you see something, let us know. So we could try to, try to bring the church another step forward um, where we can. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you for your work. Uh, one thing that I think he was talking about, those renovations, but if you, know, if you know the women's restroom on the hall outside of Charlie's office, both of those restrooms are now handicapped accessible. We did not have a handicapped accessible bathroom uh, in our building, uh, in this building, and we'd have that now. I also want to thank Danny Shelley for his work uh, and, and guiding us uh, so well. Uh, we are thankful for our trustees and all that they do to make our place safe and secure and welcoming. And at this time, I'm going to invite the, trust, uh, the, the uh, ushers to please come forward for our tithes and offerings.
join me in the prayer of thanksgiving that is found in your bulletin. The measure we give, O oh God, is the measure we get. Therefore, let us bring our gifts with joy, knowing that we cannot have less than what we offer, what we have back to your good purpose. For we are well only when all your children are well and thriving, according to your vision for a world redeemed. Amen. And let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and live lives worthy of the gospel. Go and love God and serve neighbor from the heart of Sumter. Amen. <laughs>